Test 4, Part 2, Passage 3 Listen to part of a lecture in a history class. Okay, we've been talking about the Great Depression. As I mentioned last class, the U.S. had gone through economic downturns before, but the Great Depression was unique because it forced millions of Americans into poverty. Does anyone remember why this economic crisis was so severe? Um, it was the stock market crash of 1929, right? The financial panic that followed led to bank failures and uh, widespread unemployment. Well, that was a factor, but the collapse of the financial markets was soon followed by a severe drought throughout much of the American Midwest. Crops failed, farms were foreclosed, and many tenant farmers were forced off the land. This put an unbelievable strain on an already weakened economy. What I want to discuss today is how the U.S. government responded to the Great Depression. In particular, I want to examine the role of President Hoover, who I believe has been unfairly blamed for not doing enough to manage this economic crisis. There is a widely held misconception that Hoover was reluctant to intervene during the Great Depression because of his uh, ideological commitment to small government and laissez-faire economic policies. This is based on a refusal to provide direct financial aid to individual citizens through the creation of federal welfare programs, yes? Why was he so opposed to this? Didn't he realize that many people needed help? Well, Hoover firmly believed that this sort of assistance should be provided by charitable organizations. He thought that welfare programs would make people dependent on the government. Anyway, Hoover became a national scapegoat for the Great Depression. In fact, the term Hooverville was commonly used to describe the uh, shanty towns that were built by homeless people during this period. Like I said, though, the popular perception of Hoover isn't very accurate. Hoover actually intervened more aggressively in the U.S. economy than any previous president. Take his efforts to provide assistance to farmers. This was a priority for Hoover because farmers had been suffering throughout much of the 1920s due to low crop prices. In 1929, Hoover created the uh, Federal Farm Board, a government agency with a budget of $500 million. This organization attempted to stabilize crop prices by buying and storing agricultural surpluses before they went on the open market. It also provided funds to farm cooperatives. Hoover firmly believed that farmers who worked together in formal cooperatives could manage the production and uh, sale of agricultural products more efficiently and profitably. Hoover also tried to protect farmers from foreclosure by increasing funding for the federal land bank system in 1932. Using these funds, Federal Land Bank was able to provide individual farmers with low-interest loans to pay off their debts with private banks. Hoover established another agency in 1932 called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Its purpose was to provide financial support to companies that were considered vital to the national interest. Initially, it offered low-interest loans to banks, railroads, insurance companies, and uh, mortgage companies. However, six months after its creation, the agency's powers were broadened so that it could provide aid directly to state governments. The organization was so effective that although it was only intended to remain in operation for 10 years, it ended up lasting until 1957. Now, Hoover wasn't just concerned with helping farmers and business owners. He also understood that something had to be done to aid the unemployed. Uh, by 1932, there were over 12 million people without jobs. So how did Hoover try to deal with this problem? Well, the solution he came up with was public works projects. Throughout his presidency, Hoover authorized the spending of large sums to build or improve government properties. Can anyone give me an example of one of these projects? Uh, the Hoover Dam? I'm pretty sure construction started at around this time. Yes, that's the most famous one. Now, some estimates place Hoover's public works spending at around $500 million per year during his term in office. These projects provided employment to thousands of Americans, and Hoover also took steps to ensure that these workers were treated fairly. In 1931, he signed the Davis-Bacon Act into law. Uh, this legislation made it mandatory for companies that receive contracts for public works projects to pay their employees fair wages. Excuse me, but why was Hoover so unsuccessful in his efforts to deal with the Great Depression? I mean, it seems like he tried a lot of different things, but the Depression lasted for several years after he left office. That's a great question. Do you remember what I mentioned earlier about Hoover's refusal to create federal welfare programs? Well, that was definitely a bad decision. 
Poverty was so widespread during the Great Depression that private charities simply couldn't cope. Another thing to keep in mind is that many of the programs Hoover did implement were limited in scope. They were the right approach, but weren't done on a grand enough scale to have a significant effect. But this doesn't mean that they didn't benefit the American people. In fact, some historians argue that Hoover laid the groundwork that made it possible for his successor, uh, President Roosevelt, to bring the Great Depression to an end. And uh, this seems pretty likely when you consider how many of Hoover's programs were adopted and expanded by President Roosevelt. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 12. What is the lecture mainly about? Thirteen. Why does the professor mention Hoovervilles? Fourteen. In the lecture, the professor describes the various actions taken by President Hoover in response to the Great Depression. Indicate whether each of the following is one of these actions. Fifteen. According to the professor, what was the purpose of the Davis-Bacon Act? Sixteen. What does the professor say about President Roosevelt? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Does anyone remember why this economic crisis was so severe? Um, it was the stock market crash of 1929, right? The financial panic that followed led to bank failures and uh, widespread unemployment. Well, that was a factor, but the collapse of the financial markets was soon followed by a severe drought throughout much of the American Midwest. 17. What does the professor mean when he says this? Well, that was a factor, 
Test 4, Part 1, Passage 3 Listen to a talk on art history. The professor is discussing naturalism. We've been looking at art history, and we discussed Impressionism in our last class. Today, we're going to talk about naturalism. Uh, some say naturalism wasn't really an art movement. Well, just like any other art movement, it has had its, shall we say, fair share of criticism. So, what's naturalism? As the term suggests, it has to do with nature, imitating nature. Naturalism is a type of art that depicts objects in a realistic way. You know, the object is portrayed as it actually appears to the naked eye. Helen, do you have a question? I'm a little confused about the terms. I read that part about naturalism, and to be honest, it sounds a lot like realism. Isn't a naturalist painting supposed to be an objective representation of some object? Looks like you've done the reading. The two terms are often used interchangeably, but they're actually two distinct movements. Okay, let me point out that just like other artistic movements, naturalism encompassed all the arts, theater, literature, painting. Now, if I were to illustrate the difference between the two, I might put it this way. I think you all know Gustave Flaubert, right? Famous for Madame Bovary? So, Flaubert was a realist, and his objective as such was to give an honest depiction of his characters. Now, Ernest Messonnier, he's a 19th century French painter and sculptor known for paintings with military scenes. His purpose as a naturalist was to give a visually accurate depiction of his subjects. Do you see the difference between the two? Um, are you saying that realism is an honest depiction of the subject, while naturalism is how the object appears in reality? Okay, but realism depicts subjects without adornment. The subject's real nature is portrayed, whereas naturalism depicts the subject as it physically exists. Maybe I can make this clearer by, well, let's take two paintings of the same woman. In reality, the woman is gaudily made up. The realist paints the woman without all the heavy makeup, so what we see is a plain-looking woman. Perhaps that's what the realist observed, and that's what he wanted to put across. The naturalist paints the woman exactly as she visually appears, with all the gaudy makeup, okay? Oh, I get it now. But I find it odd that these two movements were both popular during the 19th century, although they were totally unassociated with each other. Yeah, that's a good point. Perhaps their only connection is that when realism was in full swing, the movement supported naturalism as a response to Romanticism's idealism. But naturalism had a more Darwinian outlook. Ugly things are a part of life, naturalism seemed to be saying. A lot of what nature produces is accidental, but whatever is produced must be accepted as reality. This is the real world, the movement proclaimed. So, the naturalist movement did have its adherents, and you might be surprised to know that the modern Greeks had a role in popularizing it in the 19th century. Can anyone tell me why this might be unusual? Um, I think the Greeks have always been known as idealists, and naturalism is not about idealism. Right. Let me give you a bit of history here. During the Archaic period, which was about 800 to 500 BC, the kouroi, or statues of young naked men, were popular, and there was a standard that the ancient Greek sculptors adhered to and this made the Kuroi look identical. Yes, Bill, did you want to say something? Sorry to interrupt, but didn't the Greeks want to make their statues symmetrical, like the Egyptians did? Wasn't it all about symmetry? Yes, you're right, but the Greeks wanted to apply the actual proportions of the human body to their statues, so instead of producing geometric figures like the Egyptians did, the Greeks tried to make the lines of the Kuroi seem natural. Did you notice this? Yes, I did. But I wasn't sure about the symmetry part. I guess naturalism took hold even in ancient Greece. Absolutely. So let me tell you a story. There were these two very talented artists, Zeuxis and Paratius. This is true, by the way. It's recorded in Pliny the Elder's encyclopedic Naturalis Historia. So the two Athenian painters are reported to have challenged each other as to who was a better naturalist painter. Zeuxis painted grapes, which appeared so real that birds flew down from the sky to actually peck at them. But Paratius showed Zeuxis his painting and said, I'm the better painter. And Zeuxis said something like, Well, remove the curtain from your painting, whereby Paratius informed Zeuxis that the curtain was part of the painting. Hilarious, huh? 
Zeuxis is believed to have said, I fooled the birds, but Paratius fooled Zeuxis. I want to point out, though, that being too true to nature is why naturalism was criticized. It does seem a bit less creative than other art styles. Yes, that's exactly what critics said. Nevertheless, we need to remember that naturalism did give impetus to the realist movement. Perhaps naturalism was short lived because, in their zeal to portray reality, many naturalist artists often selected the harshest and bleakest subjects, like slums, with all their poverty and filth, and this tendency did not go over well with people who sought beauty. On the other hand, let's consider photography. I mean, if the object of naturalism is to be as accurate as possible, it seems logical that photography would be considered a naturalist art form, right? I'd say so. I'd even argue that photography is more accurate than painting. Sure, but we need to take note that some photographers don't take pictures simply to portray what's in front of their lens. They manipulate pictures by modifying the background a bit or choosing a certain type of lighting or a particular part of the day to take pictures. Therefore, the final appearance of the photos depends on the photographer's perspective and intent. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 12. What does the professor mainly discuss? Thirteen. What does the professor say about naturalism as an art movement? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Do you see the difference between the two? Um, are you saying that realism is an honest depiction of the subject, while naturalism is how the object appears in reality? Okay, but realism depicts subjects without adornment. The subject's real nature is portrayed, whereas naturalism depicts the subject as it physically exists. Maybe I can make this clearer by, well, Let's take two paintings of the same woman. 14. What does the professor mean when he says this? Maybe I can make this clearer by. Fifteen, according to the professor, what is the objective of naturalism? Sixteen. What does the professor imply about the naturalism movement?
17. Why is photography not always a form of naturalism?